Um, if you stay with us past 145, there will be a lot of opportunity in this Mansfield track to uh, engage your ideas with those others as we begin to get more feedback on uh, the idea of building the program so on the Mansfield. To kick it off, we've got Kent McFarland, who's a longtime friend and a conservation biologist, and a co-founder of the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, with over 20 years of experience working in the mountains of the Northeast. And this talk is called the One Tugs on Mount Mansfield. You can find it attached to the rest of the world. Discoveries and some of the population connectivity. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody. All right. Got a few bird lovers here. Good. How many people have seen Big Mouse Thrush? Most everybody. Well, I'm going to focus a little bit today on Big Mouse Thrush and on uh, Mount Mansfield. And uh, what I'm going to try to do is, as the title suggests, is show how important it is to not just think about all the research we're doing on Mount Mansfield, but think about everywhere else that's affecting Mount Mansfield. And as a lot of people know um, that have been involved in DMC meetings over the years, we do a lot of work on the birds on Mount Mansfield and elsewhere. And sort of our flagship bird species is Big Nile's Thrush. Um, and it's pretty much on, as you can see all the red here, it's pretty much on every conservation watch list you can imagine. It's, uh, it's probably one of the rarest um, migratory songbirds in North America. And all the work that's gone into Big Nile's Thrush over the years has spawned uh, what's called the International Big Nile's Thrush Conservation Group, <laughs> which is a really long uh, title of Basically, seven countries of biologists and policymakers have come together to try to come up with an action plan for Big Nile's thrush in order to keep it off of things like endangered Federal Endangered Species Act um, and actually keep its population stable. So, using the best science possible, you know, what can we do with conservation action on Big Nile's thrush to keep its population viable across the Northeast? And as part of that, looking at what was known in the science at the time back in the Oh, around 2009 or so, what was really evident was that we actually knew a lot about the breeding grounds after a decade or two of, of doing big metals research. We knew a reasonable bit about, about the wintering grounds down here in the Caribbean, uh, but really in between, the only thing we knew about what the bird did was it flew to one place to the other, and that was about it. Uh, and some of the work we did, we knew that they flew um, sort of in a, a and the fall, they flew in a direction where they jumped off the coast and ended up in the Dominican Republic based on some landing data that was in the middle of the land. And in the spring, it seemed like they went up through Florida. But there was this huge black box of understanding connectivity between what is going on in the breeding grounds up here, like on Mount Mansfield, and what was going on in the wintering grounds. How connected were they? Are birds on Mount Mansfield going to one spot in the Dominican Republic of Haiti, Cuba, or Jamaica? Or are they spreading out across the wintering grounds? And on their way down there, how are they getting there? Are they flying? They're not flying nonstop, probably. They're stopping in places. And it was really felt by the scientific committee of the International Medical Thrush Working Group that having an understanding of that population connectivity might be a key to conservation. And it might be a key to really preserving um, populations that are on Mount Mansfield and other big mountains like that. So we set out to try to figure out how connected are bird populations on Mount Mansfield to other populations, um, both on the wintering grounds and other areas in the Northeast. Um, so the first way we did that was um, we actually used chemistry. So I get to jump back to chemistry 101 here. I'm sure everybody recognizes this. It's like, oh yeah, I remember this. But uh, you'll notice that this is a, a proton and electron. It's hydrogen. Hydrogen normally has one proton. But there's also an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium that actually has a neutron in its head. It's called heavy water. We use it for nuclear power plants. Really. It's heavier. It's got a higher, a higher mass. Um, and we can actually use that, believe it or not, to study birds. Um, and so the neat thing about these isotopes is that they vary from Florida up through the Northeast. So you can see on the map um, the, the amount of deuterium that is in rainwater in Florida is heavily depleted compared to how much there is up in the Northeast. So it's a really neat signature. The other cool thing about this isotope is, is that it builds up into animals. It comes down from rainwater onto the surface, goes into the plants, goes into the herbivorous insects, then goes into the big nose thrush that eats the herbivorous insects, then goes into the feathers of the big nose thrush, effectively putting a um, signature of where that feather was grown by how much of this deuterium isotope is in their feather, allowing us to then 
place where the bird grew that feather. The cool thing about these birds is, is that every year on Mount Mansfield and the other peaks in the breeding season is they molt their, all their feathers and they grow new ones. So in July and August, right before they're going to go on fall migration, they grow new feathers on Mount Mansfield. So if we take a little bit of feather sample off of these birds on Mount Mansfield, we can then find out what the isotope ratio is in them. And we can go somewhere else and take another bit of feather off the birds and find out where they came from. So we can produce a map, a signature map, of where they were just based on the material. So we did that because we wanted to know, hey, are all these birds on Mount Mansfield going to one spot that might be in trouble in the wintering grounds, that might be deforested? Or are they spreading out across the wintering grounds? So if you deforest one section of the wintering grounds, you're not taking all the Mount Mansfield birds, you're taking maybe a few birds from each area across the breeding ground. And quickly on this one, really what we found in this early work is, is that here's two plots on the bottom, Mount Mansfield and Stratton in Vermont, and if you just ignore most of the stuff and go way to the end, you'll see that the variation in the deuterium data from their tail feathers is really low on those plots. So you can really pinpoint that those birds grew those feathers on those plots. But if you travel the whole way down to the Dominican Republic here, and don't hang out on the beach and actually go up in the mountains where it's a little rougher, here in the mountains where Big Hills Thrush live, you'll see that if you go the whole way to the end again, the coefficient of variation is a lot higher for the deuterium levels. It turns out when you trace their, the birds feathers that are found on those breeding sites down in those mountains. They come from all different sites across the entire breeding range in the Northeast, from as far north as Quebec down to Mount Mansfield. So it turns out the population connectivity between the summering grounds and the wintering grounds is actually fairly weak on a very um, small scale. So that if you can go to any section of forest down in the Dominican Republic, you're liable to find a big male structure from anywhere on the breeding grounds. That's good news. If you have deforestation somewhere, such as a small plot in the mountains of the Dominican Republic, um, and you lose all that habitat, you're only going to lose a few birds from each area of the breeding grounds. You're not going to lose all the birds from Mount Mansfield in one place. So they're dispersed a little bit in the wintering grounds. Well, that wasn't enough for us. We really wanted to find out really where are individual birds going. And so, um, actually, no, I'll reverse back. That wasn't enough for us because we wanted to find out really the dispersal on the breeding grounds too, so that when a young bird, after it fledges and it spends its winter time in the Dominican Republic, when it comes back to the breeding grounds, is a nestling from Mount Mansfield going back to Mount Mansfield, or is it dispersing to some other area in the, in the breeding grounds? In other words, how much natal connectivity is there in the breeding grounds? Um, are all the birds produced on Mount Mansfield just living on Mount Mansfield as adults? or are they going really far across the breeding range and dispersing? And so we actually sampled birds the whole way across the breeding range. And the cool thing about these thrushes is that you can actually um, age them by their tail feather. And so the young birds out of their nest, they actually keep their tail feather for a whole year. So the deuterium levels that they're putting in their tail feather as nestlings, they retain those tail feathers on the wintering grounds until they come back the next year and breed for the first year. So you can actually get that tail feather and tell where it was um, hatched, where its natal grounds were. So using the deuterium then, we can go up, we can create a deuterium map and figure out, hey, this one was hatched in the Southern Green Mountains versus, you know, the Gas Bay Peninsula. And with a migratory bird, we'd expect, hey, you know, they fly several thousand kilometers. Surely they disperse several thousand kilometers over the breeding range when they come back as adults. Well, it turns out, um, for some reason on this, it's really hard to see on this thing. But anyhow, it turns out that if you look at this in squint, it turns out that most of the birds, almost all of them, 70% of them approximately, disperse only about 100 kilometers from their natal site. Very few birds are dispersing up to 200, 300, even 400 kilometers away. So even though this bird is migrating the whole way down to the Caribbean and back, the nestlings are only dispersing about 100 kilometers on average. Um, across the breeding range. And it turns out that it's even more strongly correlated to the center of the breeding range versus the edges. So the birds, the nestlings that are hatched in the center of the breeding range, they will disperse even less so than those on the edges of the breeding range, which is really an interesting finding. So it turns out that if you have problems going on, say, in Mount Mansfield or something, and you wipe out a population there, these are not great dispersers for starting new populations or restarting the population once it's lost, as suggested by their natal dispersal. So again, even though they're migrating along the way, their connectivity is really not that strong natal dispersal. 
But we still wanted to get more, uh, more deeper understanding of the connectivity of Mount Mansfield to other populations um, and the wintering grounds in and around. And so, as technology progressed over the years, we went from sort of cheating using chemistry to cheating using technology. And one of the things is, is that we spent a lot of time getting birds, like this bird picking up starts catching in a net on Mount Mansfield, and putting little small bands on them. And the bands allow us every year and year out to sort of track what individuals and populations are doing on Mount Mansfield. And, you know, technically if you could recapture them somewhere else, they might track um, the population somewhere else. But the difficulty of that is, is that it's really hard to recapture a one-banded bird, say, down in the Dominican Republic. It's 150,000 big nose thrushes or something. The odds of catching one of them 2,000 kilometers away is, is really, really uh, low. We have done it three times. We've captured three birds, two on Mount Mansfield down in the Dominican Republic, the same birds, and we've captured one that we abandoned in the Dominican Republic back on Mount Mansfield. And for other researchers looking at songbirds, it's almost unheard of. So it's just another indication of how rare this bird is. But, you know, N equals three, pretty low sample size. So we've gone to technology to track these birds year round, and we use what are called geolocators. And these are tiny little backpacks that they wear that capture light levels in the exact time of day. Give it viewing us um, every day, sort of in a constellation of what time the sun came up and what time the sun went down. And using that data on these chips that we get back the next year off the bird, we can actually drive latitude and longitude. So the, the noon time of the sun gives us uh, longitude, and the amount of sun that they get gives us latitude. Um, and so we can actually, within reason, figure out where they were on, on the face of the earth um, at any given time, at any given day, allowing us to track them year-round if we can get them back and download the data off their backpacks. So we did that, and one of the problems is they live in really thick habitat, so the data you get for the sunlight is a little messy, and so it's sometimes it's hard to tell what, um, what is daybreak and what isn't daybreak. And because of that, the day length is really difficult to tell. And so just from this, I just want you to notice that it's really hard actually to get latitude for big nose thrushes. Our accuracy is only about 700 kilometers. Um, but lat longitude is really quite easy. And with that, uh, we found out how long it takes them to migrate. And the big thing about it is, is that it takes them almost twice as long to migrate southward in the fall as it does come back in the spring, which makes you wonder what's going on. And it turns out the biggest discovery we have of this is that they have a, a, about a two-week stopover in uh, either Cuba or uh, the Grand Bahamas. Um, and it seems strange because it's not very far away from where they end up, which is the Dominican Republic. So unbeknownst to us, they stop over for almost two weeks before continuing on to their wintering grounds. Never knew that before. Never knew the connection between Mount Mansfield and the Bahamas, but there is one now. Uh, they end up wintering on... Uh, Hispaniola, all the thrushes we did this with on Mount Mansfield go to Hispaniola in the winter there. Um, we, we sort of knew that, but this is really hard data showing us that that's where they are. So now we've established sort of a, a strong connection between Mount Mansfield, the Bahamas, and Hispaniola. Um, strong enough that, uh, you know, we really have to pay, to pay attention to conservation there if we're going to have to pay attention to conservation on Mount Mansfield. And then to end real quickly, um, sort of some breaking stuff we're working on. Another small bird on Mount Mansfield, the black hole warbler, breeds on Mount Mansfield. You can imagine this bird weighs about half of an ounce. It easily fits in the palm of your hand. Um, and for about 50 years, we've thought that perhaps these all the black hole warblers in North America go to the Atlantic coast, the northeast Atlantic coast, and then they would disappear off of radar sightings. They would take off and migrate at night and disappear. And it was thought that they flew maybe nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean the whole way down to South America. We were actually able to use these light level geolocators, and uh, this is some hot data just off the press and uh, in review right now. But we've actually found out that these birds, three birds from Mount Mansfield, they took off from Mount Mansfield, went to the coast, where they fattened themselves up, probably tripled their weight, and one night they took off. And one of them flew for 73 straight hours without stopping and landed in the Dominican Republic for a quick stopover before continuing on to Venezuela. So nonstop, 73 hours, the bird weighs a half of an ounce. Pretty amazing story. Um, and another connection now between Mansfield and now stopover in the Caribbean and in Venezuela. So the, so the story here with all this, all this connectivity is, is that here's a peak in the Dominican Republic. It looks a lot like our Green Mountains. Um, and 
the story is, is that we really want to have Mount Mansfield be a, keep being a special place for us with bird songs in the breeding season, sort of, you know, calling out as we're hiking along. I think the loss of that would be, would be huge, let alone be ecologically. If we want to keep that, we have to pay attention to places like this, where the birds are spending a big portion of their time in the Dominican Republic. A lot of places look like this, and there's a lot of economic stuff on that mountain in the Dominican Republic. But unfortunately, a lot of places also look like this in Haiti, where a big stretch used to be right there, and now it is sort of a rock garden where, unfortunately, poor farmers, the only thing they can do is uh, cut the forest down and try to make a living. So really, the, the bottom line is Mount Mansfield is connected to the world, and all of our research there has to uh, work towards understanding conservation across the hemisphere for us to keep Mansfield intact. I know it was fast, and I'd be happy to answer questions. important to actually visit the Bahamas soon and figure out what's going on in this stopover period. These 14 days can be really important. There's got to be a big reason why they're spending 14 days in our That's a really, really part of the story. Right? Sure. <laughs>